Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRNAM for Friday, August 11th, 2023. At our top story today, gene patterns shape our food choices. And joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Dr. Joanne Cole is with the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Joanne, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, l- let's talk about food patterns. And I, you know, as I'm shopping at the local grocery store, picking up certain items, and I feel like in some ways I'm kind of drawn to those items, especially that package of Doritos. You and the team have done a lot of research on gene patterns. How do they shape our food decisions, our, our food choices? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And there's one thing very important to keep in mind is that so much of the foods we choose to eat is driven by things other than our genes, right? Our environment, the way we were raised, food availability, culture, upbringing. And so that actually really does make up the majority of the decisions. Um, But interestingly, our genes do account for a small amount of our flavor preferences, and our adaptive behavioral preferences. And so um, although they're small, they tend to be strong. Um, And I could give like an easy example. Yeah, sure. Um, The one of the classic examples that many people know about is the cilantro gene, Um, right? So there is an olfactory receptor in your nose that senses and binds to aroma compounds in cilantro. And so if you have a certain version of this olfactory receptor gene, you may perceive cilantro as a soapy flavor as opposed to a fruity flavor. So that's a great example of different people having different gene versions of an of the cilantro olfactory receptor gene and it binding cilantro different. And that like sends different signals to the brains. And so they perceive different flavor. Yeah, very interesting. I, the one I thought you were going to go for is chocolate because I have a craving for chocolate. I'm sure that there is something in there in my genes that make me want to crave chocolate other than I like the sweetness. Uh, Let me ask you, you know, human beings, and again, I'm not, I'm a lay person, so I don't have your level of expertise, but my understanding is humans have evolved over time. We're all kind of mutations. How have our genes, I'm assuming our genes have changed over time and our preferences have changed over time. Maybe, you know, we were nut and food people or nut and uh, meat people. Now over generations and generations of humans, our genes have evolved to want different things. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a whole area of research that focuses on evolutionary adaptation to food seeking behavior or food preferences. It's not my personal area of expertise, but there absolutely has been changes over time. And and again, a classic example of that would be, you know, lactase persistence, being able to, as an adult, still break down Um, lactose sugars. Um, And so some people, depending on their background, genetic background and evolutionary migration patterns may or may not be able to break down lactose as adults or not. And there's many more examples of that. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. How how do you link the research you and the team have done to what's going on today? Or or can you? Uh, We have preferences for certain types of foods. They're in our genetics. There's also socioeconomic factors, but there are diseases like diabetes, obesity, cancer. Is there a link between the work that you're doing and some of these other diseases, for example, having a predisposition, for example? Yeah, so that's a, that's a complicated question, but I do think that's the that's the goal, right? I mean, that that's the goal of wanting to study this is so that we can better improve human health, um, and hopefully, potentially through personalizing nutrition therapy, so that people are sticking to better guidelines for eating healthier, making it easier to eat healthier so they can decrease their their risk of these metabolic diseases like diabetes and obesity or cancer. And so I specifically work a little bit in the diabetes and metabolic disease space. And one of the things I'm interested in is if I can identify the genes that are directly involved in why a person is eating what they're eating, say because of flavor preferences, which have a really strong impact on whether someone's going to buy that food or enjoy that food or not enjoy that food. Um, And so I wanna capitalize on those really strong flavor preferences and see if we can use them as a tool to help people find new foods that maybe have similar compounds that they know that they have a positive reward response to because of their genetic profile um, and maybe give them better 
guidance on healthier eating patterns. Or for example, if there were two foods and one happens to be have a lower glycemic index than the other, but they have similar flavor compounds and elicit a similar reward response in the brain, then maybe we can help guide people to the healthier choice um, based on their genetic profile and pre genetic predisposition to different flavors. So I think it's a little bit, I mean, it's early. This is very early research, but I think it's an exciting direction we can go. Um, actually, I have a, a, another really amazing idea to take sure. this to be... Um, if we could identify, so as I mentioned, the olfactory receptor, it's a receptor. It binds kind of like a lock and key um, to different flavor compounds. And so these are natural flavor compounds in different foods, and they tend to bind to taste receptors or smell receptors. But what if we could derive natural or synthetic compounds that also bind? Like, could we alter someone's response to different foods and flavors? Can we have like a shaker of like the, the compounds that make someone positively react to food and put that on healthy food. So that's kind of like a pie in the sky idea, but that would be a very cool biological intervention to guide people towards healthier food. Yeah, it sounds like something McCormick Spice Company may want to think about. They should partner with you. And yeah, then that'd they, be great. You know, and then put it on the crab case because they make the old bay. Anyway, Joanne, I need to take a very quick break. In all seriousness, when we come back, I want to talk about the how this information will help nutritionists. And also we'll talk more about personalization. You're gonna to wanna to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We wanna make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. We're joined by Dr. Joanne Cole of the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Joanne, thanks so much for sticking with us this morning for segment number two. Of course. Yeah. Happy to be here. All right, let's talk about how your research, and I know you're in the early stages, so I don't want to presuppose here. But how, a lot of Americans, a lot of people in general working with a nutritionist, maybe they're trying to loosen their uh, waistline, maybe they're trying to get in better health, better shape. How could the personalization you're talking about within each of us are our genes, we're individuals, how would that shape our nutritional guidance in the future? Yeah. And as you iterated, reiterated that this is kind of... Um early in the research, right? The genetic component is still kind of just scratching the surface. But I do think one thing we could take away is just the concept that flavor is a primary driver of food choice. And I don't think we should shy away from that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I don't think the one size fits all approach to nutrition therapy is going to work. And so I think um, people need to be open with their nutritionists about the foods and flavors they crave and they go towards. And so maybe together they can personalize plans based on those um, patterns that they're used to and the diets that they're used to and the flavors that they like. Um, in terms of bringing in the genetics, I think that's a next step um, and probably not ready for primetime clinical action, but it would be amazing one day to be able to say, hey, here, take my genetic profile 
and, and tell me what I should be eating based on flavor preferences. Um, but right now we just have a few really low hanging fruit examples like the cilantro one um, and a handful of others. But I'm that's what I'm working on now, trying to dig in to those. And, and to your point, you know, there's something called 23andMe where you can send your information to a service. They come back and tell you all your ancestry and everything. Is that kind of where we, at, at some point in the future, might be able to submit our information? Maybe it's a saliva test. I don't know. However you do it, maybe it's a blood stick. I, I, you know, you're the expert. But is that is that what you're kind of envisioning is, hey, let's figure out, let's understand the programming behind all this. And then that would help shape your doctor. That'd be actually help with preventative medicine. Yeah. I would love to see that with a few like asterisks, like one, all genetic direct to consumer genetic testing. If you're going to use it for clinical or medical advice, you should be talking about your results with your medical provider. Um, and I think that's so important because a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of companies out there that they say they can get your genes and tell you to do all these things. Um, and they learn and they know so much about you based on your genes. And, and unfortunately, a lot of those are, are kind of false advertising. So I would be weary of a lot of those other companies, not necessarily 23andMe, which does a great job with ancestry and some high level findings. Um, but uh, I would just be careful about the current companies out there that say they can do this. But I do think that it would be very Fascinating if a nutritionist uh, who has an expertise in genomics could take some genomic profile and understand different flavor profiles. And then together you work with your nutritionist on a plan forward. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, that would be a goal. Yeah, I mean, it, it would just sound amazing. And, and you know, there's an old saying when you're playing shortstop or third base in, in baseball, you want to be on your, your balls or your feet. You don't want to be back on your heels. It feels like what you're doing is you're really on the balls of your feet, ready to go towards the ball. What, what are some of the next steps in terms of timing, um, expectations? I know you're just at the very infancy of all this, but take us through a little bit what, you're, what you perceive to be your expectation for additional research and the timeline around that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I'm working on right now is kind of deciphering some of the complexities of the human genome. So when we do these studies, um, we are scanning 3 billion bases of the human genome just to find statistical associations on a computer between a trait and a genotype. And so it's a very statistical heavy approach and it's fully computational, but we're not yet translating it to human studies. So a couple of the next steps I'm working on right now are, one, um, once we find this statistical association, can we glean more information from it? Because unfortunately, it doesn't pinpoint the gene quite yet. So there's some extra steps that need to say, oh, we think it's this gene that's controlling this flavor perception. So we got to do those computational approaches for that method. But then the important next steps will, set, will be, can we translate this to human studies actually? And so something I'm working on right now and hopefully in the next few years will be running some pilot human studies to see whether an olfactory receptor associated with certain food liking, for example, actually elicits a response in humans. They have different preferences and can trigger different brain reward regions, um, reward regions of the brain. So that's kind of my next steps is translation to human studies. Yeah, it, I mean, it's really amazing. And it has such, so many far reaching implications. I mean, just thinking about even some of the current diseases, how this could be applied. Joanne, we're going to have to leave it there. Congratulations on the great research thus far. And look, we look forward to checking in with you later on at some point in the future. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Great. Thank you so much. And that wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN Weekly. We'll be joined by NASDAQ's Monica Malpass, and then we'll be taking a look back at some of our best segments for the week. You're not going to want to miss it. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.
Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.